Ambassador Norman Eisen, given your own personal history and your association with the Czech Republic, did you get to ask uh, President Obama to, to be the ambassador here? Uh, absolutely not. Having known Barack Obama since we were first-year law students, 1988, uh, he knew that I was the, at least the diplomatic of ambassadorial candidates. And but for the happenstance of the president knowing that my mother was from here and prized this beautiful city, Prague, above all others in the world, I never would have been asked. It occurred to him to offer me the job in order to return to this, uh, these lands that my mother fled twice under the most tragic of historical circumstances. And you've just written a book called The Last Palace uh, about your experience here and your mother's experience. Where is The Last Palace, Norman? Uh, as the crow flies, The Last Palace is due north, just on the other side of Prague Castle. But this scene that we're looking at, actually, this is one of the locations right outside the window here that I write about in The Last Palace. Is there something special in the history of modern democracy about the Czech Republic, about Prague, 68, 89? Uh, it's apocryphally attributed to Otto von Bismarck that he who controls Prague controls Europe because we're right in the heart of Europe. We're on the pivot point between West and East. And I think that uh, for a variety of complicated reasons, uh, Prague has been the proving ground for both the, the heights of democracy and its depths as we chart the ups and downs, the explosion, the democratic surge of 1918, the depths of the German occupation of World War II, the flowering, the hopes again of 1945 that there would be a second great chapter of Czechoslovak democracy, the devastation of the coup, the communist bloodless coup of 1948. 68, democracy flowers again, communism with a human face of Dubček only to be crushed by another Soviet initiative, this time the Soviet bloc invasion. 89, as I was telling you, I write, this is where the marchers on that fateful night the, when the Velvet Revolution began in 19, November 1989, the marchers came down this street from Charles University and just the other side of that beautiful building, the, uh, the Czech Na National Theater, uh, uh, they gathered uh, and were brutally uh, massacred by the communist regime, an overreaction that led to the toppling of communism in just 10 days, the Samatova Revolutse, the Velvet Revolution. And then when I came back, uh, I discovered that the whole drama was playing out again the, uh, with the Russian influence creeping up uh, across Europe. And, and I write about that. The past hundred years, all those ups and downs in Europe for democracy, for the European and American alliance, then the Czech and American alliance in the last palace. Norman, or maybe I should call you Norm. As you wish. <laughs> Norm Eisen, the former, you, you've done so many things, Norm, that I, I'm not going to include all of them, but uh, U.S. Ambassador to Czech Republic, 2011-2014, uh, um, very well-known television pundit, and the author, The Last Palace, a book about Europe's turbulent century, written from the perspective of Prague and the history of democracy. Uh, Norm, why did you write The Last Palace? Uh, well, uh, I came, I returned to Washington uh, from Prague, and, and I heard so many incredible stories about the uh, house that I lived in, the Villa Petchek, one of the legendarily beautiful houses of this magnificent city of Prague where we're chatting, and the people who live there. And I realized that their stories was a prism 
for the turbulence, the ups and downs of democracy, but I didn't want to write a dry book. I wanted to bring this incredible century of American engagement starting in 1918 with Wilson's pivot uh, towards uh, fully recognizing that democracy is not American, it's not European, it's transatlantic. So this is a, a Wilsonian treatise. It, it is a, it follows the, through the lives and loves and heartbreak and, and the successes and the crushing losses of my five protagonists, four of whom preceded me in the house and the fifth, my Czechoslovak mother, whose life paralleled the, uh, uh, all of these events. Um, it follows the Wilsonian idea in all of its ups and downs over the past hundred years. And I targeted 2018, the hundredth anniversary of that democracy, thinking it would be a celebration, a triumph. So the, so the heroine of this book, and perhaps the, the, the guiding spirit of this city is democracy itself. Well, uh, democracy only lives through the people. And I feature these five women and men and their adventures in democracy. But in, in a sense, uh, the people of Prague are also uh, a hero of the book. There is a recurring character, the Prague Watchers, the Flaneurs of Prague. It turns out that Prague has a strong tradition of people who walk the streets and admire its beauty and preserve its legends. So those people and their ups and downs as they at times boldly speak out, protest, demonstrate for democracy, other times they're crushed by the enemies of democracy. So, so they're a character too. I know you studied at Harvard Law School, but you're also a keen historian. In a recent New York Times opinion piece, you suggested that a reading of history should make us optimistic about the future of democracy. Some people, of course, are more pessimistic. Enlighten us, Norm. Why should history teach us that we should be optimistic about democracy? Um, the reason I'm optimistic is because having studied the century and gone in depth over the past hundred years and seen the fluctuations, uh, democracy has faced down far greater challenges than the ones we're encountering now. But I look at the challenges and the strength that is conferred by these five aspects of democracy, the personal, the political, press freedom. Now I write, I appear on television, so I participate in that, free markets, and juridical freedom, the freedom of the rule of law as a lawyer, it's very important to me. Uh, and uh, the weakness in regimes that don't have those. Right outside these windows where we're sitting, the Czech communist regime toppled because of the weakness in 1989. So the combination of democracy's strength, the performance over the past hundred years on greater challenges, the weakness of its adversaries leads me to be optimistic. Now, I'm optimistic, but I'm realistic. I won't predict how long or short, the evening, the eclipse, the winter of democracy will be. Is there anything unique about, and as a historian, I, I'm guessing you will say no, but is there anything unique about the early 21st century in terms of the, 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 the social and the economic forces that are shaping our world that should make us more concerned, more wary about what's going on? Uh, or, or technological forces? Uh, we, in, the, in, the, in Tehillim, the, uh, in the, the Psalms of King David. Uh, uh, it's, uh, maybe it's in Mishle, the Proverbs. Somewhere in the Jewish Bible, it says, Ein chadash tachat hashemesh. There is nothing new under the sun. And uh, 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 as a student of history, the, uh, all of the trends that seem so unique to us are echoed by the past. Certainly, we're in a technological inflection point. Uh, you're an authority on the doings of Silicon Valley, the internet, social media, uh, AI, big data, and all the rest. Yes, but is that more of a singularity than the Industrial Revolution? I don't think so. It's, I would argue, it's on a par with the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century. Um, we're in a, econ I'm of the school, that we're uh, still feeling the aftershocks of the economic 
cataclysm, the Great Recession of 2008. I was privileged before I was ambassador to help repair what was broken working with President Obama as a lawyer for financial regulatory reform. So I saw the horrible hemorrhaging up close, the trauma. Um, I'm very proud of the of the ways in which the Obama administration addressed it, but that damage is still here. It's very like the damage of 1929 uh, and the, the, the aftermath and, and the upheaval, the global upheaval that followed. So um, these are not unique phenomena that we're encountering today, uh, but they are singular, they're unusual, they're 100-year floods, and we've got to take them very seriously. You were the, the head of the government ethics. I was the president's ethics czar. I was the president's advisor on ethics and on reform. A, I was his a, a chief curious political. term to be a, an ethics czar. Yes, my mother, his Jewish, uh, European Jewish Holocaust survivor, loved to say to people, it is the only time a czar has ever been good for the Jews. Was your mother a Democrat? Not a small, not a big D Democrat, but was there something about your mother that brought out your love of democracy and the way she raised you, perhaps as a survivor of the Holocaust? My mother was both a big and a small D Democrat. She was very fiercely uh, attached to the Democratic Party, uh, very liberal. My father was a little more dubious. My father was a businessman. And he was a good small D Democrat, but he didn't like those uh, more intrusive do, programs. Do you have children, Norm? I do. I have one daughter. And what should parents do if they want to nurture children who respect democracy? Parents who want to nurture children who... Lovers of democracy like you. Who, parents who want to nurture children to not just respect democracy, but to love democracy, must tell them stories. That's part of the reason I wrote The Last Palace as I did, not as an abstract treatise, but as the story of five people and their journey through the democratic century. We liberal Democrats must have stories. We need powerful narratives. Liberal democracy is relatively new. It just dates from the 18th century in its current form. We're battling ideologies, some of them, that are the worst of millennia. So we need our own stories. So tell your children stories about democracy. Read to them from the last palace. They'll love it. <laughs>